Well, good evening to everybody. Um, this is Theology Thursday at Pelham Road again. And as you can see, uh, that's not Ashley. <clears throat> that's Jay Keeney. Welcome, Jay. Hey, John. Thank you. Jay is the coordinator of the CBF of South Carolina. He's been doing that for eight years. Prior to that, he was pastor in Alabama. Then prior to that, a pastor in South Carolina. So, Jay, uh, I'll just begin by asking you some questions, and we'll have some back and forth about uh, these days that we're living through. That sounds great. Thanks, John. Where'd you grow up, by the way? Well, let me say first that to uh, Pelham Road folks, thank you so much for your partnership with CBF South Carolina through the years. Um, Y'all have been great partners. You've sent folks to work at mission sites all across the state. You've sent money through the years. It's remarkable. Things, things happen good for the kingdom of Christ because of the ways we partner together. So thank you so much for that. Well, thank um, you. Yeah, yeah. And I'll say, um, let's see, I grew up in suburban Atlanta. My, my dad worked for Delta Airlines, and so I grew up 15 minutes from the airport on the south side of town, College okay. Park in Riverdale, if folks know that area. Where'd you go to high school? North Clayton High School, across the street from the church that where we were members, Second Baptist mm -hmm. College Park. You now that's Clayton the County, right? Clayton the County, that's right. Yeah, that's right. All right. Yeah. Um, now, you, how long have you been married? 30 years? Uh, It'll be 29 next week. Wow. Yeah. You yeah. have two children, right? I do. Emma is 19. She'll turn 20 in August. She's a sophomore now at the College of Charleston. Jesse's 23, a recent College of Charleston grad who's still in Charleston working in a restaurant and playing music. All right. So they're both in Charleston. So you go to Charleston every weekend? <laughs> well, there have been times where when the children were at my house and I was paying rent in Charleston, I was like, why isn't, why isn't one of us in Charleston since I'm paying rent? Down there? <laughs> but, uh, uh, we, I go about once a month for, for work and, you know, it's nice to, to go down to, to visit Metanoia. I'm on the board at Metanoia. And so about mm -hmm. once a month, I'll go down for that board meeting and visit churches in the area too and get to see the kids. So that's nice. Melanie is jealous. Melanie, my wife, works at Clemson. So mm -hmm. she's kind of, she's more stuck at the house than I am. But. Now, speaking of uh, universities and loyalties, I want to say that you're like a three-time Duke graduate. Is that right? Two-time, two-time Duke graduate. Yeah. Um, Mercer University undergrad first, and then Master of Divinity and Master of Theology from the Divinity School at Duke. <clears throat> but m most of that time there, uh, I was on staff at a church in Chapel Hill, Mm -hmm. And so really became a Tar Heel fan as opposed to a Blue Devil fan. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we lived in Chapel Hill, too. Uh, okay. And so Duke was the commute. But So you've, com you've committed to being a uh, North Carolina fan? Yes. Did you grow up a Bulldog fan in Georgia or not? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, yeah. Mercer, Mercer at the time didn't have a football team. I, I was on the baseball team my freshman year. Didn't see a lot of future in that, so moved on to intramural well, softball, which suited me a lot better. Now, see, I didn't know you played baseball. I would now. Let me see if I can guess. Thinking of of your physical of talents, I would say you were like a middle infielder. I, I was an outfielder, typically left or center field. Okay. Uh, although in high school, I caught also. Okay. See, I kind of had you pegged for second base, being able to. Uh, double play there but you know. <laughs> uh, well we'll get on to some questions because right. to tune into this uh, they they like for us to get to some pressing issues of, of at least if not theology at least the contours of religion sure. and, and Christianity but before I get to the serious question I have one sort of playful question okay what movie what movie traumatized you as a a child or a teenager? Okay, well, so I was in elementary school in the mid 70s, right? I started first grade in 75. Um, and so you would have thought that the movie that would have really freaked me out was Protection in the Nuclear Age, which was a film from the civil defense folks. <laughs> if you Google that, it's on YouTube, it is terrifying. But the one, the one that, 
that really freaked me out was Ricky Tiki Tavi. Do you know this story? No, I don't know. Really? So it, it was, they showed it in elementary school. It was an animation of a book um, about an Indian, Asian Indian family who had a pet mongoose who protected the family from cobras, right? And some of those snakes lived under the little boy's bed. <laughs> and so <laughs> for ages, I was terrified of putting my feet on the floor getting out of bed. It would be a launch into the bedroom because I was convinced there were snakes under the bed. They should never have shown that to elementary kids. <laughs> they showed that in the classroom like the first and second graders. Yes, 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 yes. The moral of the story was to try to maybe help you understand Indian culture? I have no idea. Make friends with a mongoose? <laughs> I have no idea what the, what the point of that was. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's on YouTube too. It's Ricky Tiki Tavi. Tavi. T A V I. R I K I or K K I T I K I uh, T A V I. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll look that up. Uh, you know, that's, uh, I've asked that question several times. Usually uh, somebody your age, it's maybe uh, Jaws or Friday the 13th, but uh, now I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> Very traumatizing. <laughs> All right. Um, I've been told anger is the outward expression of fear and pain. These days, I and other ministers are living with a fair amount of fear and pain about the future. So may I ask, what are you doing to deal with the abnormal anger that um, we're feeling? Um, so what I've learned about myself through the years is that um, <clears throat> I feel things in my gut first, right? So it's, it's a, I start to know something's wrong emotionally because I feel it in my stomach, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I feel a lot of that just disturbance in my stomach. Um, and I know that my sort of personality types are kind of prone toward anger and rage. And so that has been my default emotion in much of the pandemic, right? R rage at loss of control, um, at grief because of loss, the, the ways that I would do my job and the, the connections, the physical connections that I had with people, um, the, the, the anger at the limitations, anger at the, the poor response of, um, of systems and of institutions and sometimes of people in the grocery store, right? Um, and so the thing that I have tried first is to walk. So because I feel anger physically, sometimes physical um, movement, helps alleviate some of that, right? So um, in June and July alone, I've walked over 200 miles so far. <laughs> Just a lot of miles in the morning. That's a lot of anger. <laughs> but what I've discovered is it's still waiting for you when you get back home a lot of times. <laughs> uh, I'm also a meditator. So mm -hmm. I'll do some deep breathing and just sitting for a while. And that helps some too, because that puts me in touch at least with kind of what I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then what probably should be first kind of comes at the tail end for me, which is the theological reflection on it. Um, you know, just the, the grappling with the, the fallenness of sinfulness, the, the not yet fully redeemed and participating in the world as God intends it, kind of nature of creation, cosmos, reality, and, and me and people. Um, and so that, they, that moves me toward some relief for the anger in the sense that um, it's, it's not punishment, right? It's, it's not purposeful, these things that we're experiencing, right? And so anger often can spur toward change, but, you know, it, it can't change these things, right? So that, that gives me a way of sort of processing some of that. Um, and then it gives me hope that, you know, God is still involved in redeeming creation, which includes <laughs> viruses and illnesses and all kind of broken stuff, uh, mm -hmm. including us and our, the ways that we can 
cope and deal and, and, and the relationships, you know, that have been strained in the process of this. Um, it, uh, so the, the theological reflection then kind of brings me back around toward, well, what was, what has God's solution been toward this brokenness of creation, toward, um, the, 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 the decay that has creeped into the good world that God designed and, and God created. And God's response is grace, right? It is the, the work of Jesus. Um, it is outside of the ability of humans to, to, to craft or impact or change or, or rush or forestall, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, when I, when I reflect on sinfulness, it brings me back around to, to, to grace and then to the confidence that, that grace instills faith, that God still intends good. God is still at work. God is still at work through us. And then, then I'm better able to see the good responses and the, the helpful, peaceful, um, life-giving responses that have come during pandemic you know, from church people calling to check on me, from pastor friends who check on each other for the for the ways that we've been able to work through churches in CBF South Carolina and as individuals, um, as well as seeing, you know, community members who are looking out for one another, um, seeing new opportunities to serve. I, I never had the opportunity to deliver Meals on Wheels because um, I was in the road all the time. Yeah. And when we got locked down, our our church I'm a member in Anderson, they had a group who were delivering Meals on Wheels every month, but they were senior adults. And Meals on Wheels said, we really don't want senior adults because of their susceptibility and the comorbidity with coronavirus. Mm-hmm. And so it, it opened up opportunity for, for some of us who were a little bit younger uh, and had some freedom and flexibility to take on some of that service in the community. And that's been a really... Um, a really interesting, you know, kind of new opportunity uh, to be graceful and to be faithful and to be helpful. So I think that's also a great model. Um, You know, in congregational life, it takes a lot of volunteers to run a joint. And uh, ministers get used to uh, calling on others to volunteer, but I've always thought that it was good for me to be a volunteer somewhere else. Mm-hmm. see the to see it from the other side and so uh you know there's places like the Greenwood Humane Society or places or other places that you give your time and and uh, it just reminds you of, of how many people give their time to your particular efforts now you know when we think of anger oftentimes we think of a who who are we angry at you know in my life anger has usually been directed at some entity hard these days to direct it at any entity, isn't it? I mean, it's not a who anymore. Or, or, or we transfer it on to an entity that really doesn't deserve it or deserve all of it. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. We, we kick the dog and, you know, yeah. yell at our loved ones and, you know, it, it leaks out as opposed to being channeled out, you know. Right. Well, um, let me move us forward a little bit with another question. The church is always evolving. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, and it has continued to evolve. Uh, the Reformation started something. We are in a continual reformation and a reforming of the church always. The congregation doesn't always recognize it, but those of us who steer the ship always know that the world is changing, the ship is changing, everything is changing. Mm-hmm. So it is my sense that the pandemic is accelerating this change. That is my sense. The things that would have taken six or eight years to unfold are now taking six to eight months. You may or may not agree with that, but if you do agree with me, how do you think the church will be different after uh, we get a vaccine and return to uh, in-person worship and can have vacation Bible school next year? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, I mean, I think you're right. I mean, I think it has accelerated some of the changes that we already saw coming right i mean i know you've talked recently you told me the other day about the the growth of the nuns across you know sort of all religions um you know people were beginning to realize that you know our our most 
faithful church members a generation ago came 50 Sundays a year, yeah. right? That, that was the house I grew up in. Mm -hmm. If we weren't on vacation out of town, we were at church on Sunday morning, right? And that happened two weeks a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and often that was at grandparents' house and we went to their church. <laughs> um, you know, but, but, but the way life has changed in the past generation, you know, sometimes church attendance patterns have changed along with that, right? Yeah. So now people who are committed church members who say, you know, if somebody asks them, where do you go to church? Well, I go to Pelham Road Baptist Church. Um, you know, that's going to be just as true for somebody who comes 50 Sundays a year as somebody who comes once a month because mm -hmm. that's their church, right? Uh -huh. and, and regular attendance at any rate, which has changed over time, um, has become more of the norm. So mm -hmm. what the pandemic has fast forwarded is, well, now, you know, kind of nobody's been at church in most places in the ways that we expected for a long time. And so I think what some of us will discover is that, you know, we miss the community, but maybe going every single week was not what was sustaining our faith, right? That it, our faith has been sustained. So I think we're going to see some more of that sort of distancing. People are going to feel connected to church, whether or not they're physically present at church as often as, you know, a generation ago or even before the pandemic. Right. So what that's going to mean for churches is we're going to have to figure out how we schedule folks to work in the nursery to accommodate. We've already learned we're accommodating these schedules. Right. So how do we how are we going to learn that better? Um, I think part of what it has accelerated to this move toward virtual experiences, quite obviously, you know, in seven and a half years, coordinator CBF South Carolina you know, maybe two churches in those seven and a half years ask us for any kind of support or help to, to move online or to engage online payment or things like that. Whereas, you know, in the last three months, it's been multiple congregations. We were able to give some, some grants to help churches buy equipment and to do some things to, to quickly move online. None of that, of course, is going away. I mean, I, yeah. think, I think that there will be people who were very commit who are very committed church members um who because of virus or other health problems will stay home and and do church online they can do sunday school they can see their people you know they they can participate in worship they can still feel and are a part of the community and so the way churches are going to have to adapt to that it's going to have to be somebody's job on the church staff to pay attention to who's joining online and be a resource for them, you know, to, to reach out and to, to say, we see that you joined us by Facebook Live. We're glad that you were here, a almost as if as somebody who had visited in person, you know. I don't know so, how you, you know, I, I want you to say that again. I mean, I, I hope that the folks that are listening hear how transformative, transformative that idea is. So say it one more time, and then on the other side of it, I'll interact. Okay. Well, I, and I'll say it in a slightly different way, you know, for, for all of our experience of church, being a participant in the community of faith somehow involved a physical presence at the church, mm -hmm. right? You, you, you came to church, you got to know the people, you joined the church, right? Well, with this move toward virtual experiences, there are going to be some people who, who for many reasons choose not to come back to church, whether it's for health reasons or just other reasons. Or it may be that they have found your church at some distance, right? That they're people who lived in Greenville 20 years ago who a friend of a friend shared it and now they feel connected to it. I've, I've heard stories of people who have gotten contributions from folks from across the country who either were part or never a part of the congregation who have sent them money, right? So it's, it's gonna be somebody's job at church to, to be the person who contacts and shepherds and, and uh, incorporates into the full life of the church, the folks who engage virtually, right? Al almost, you know, like the, the old fashioned visitation and follow up when a visitor would come to church, you know, right. to reach out and to say, we were so glad that you were with us. A and then here are some ways that you can continue to participate with us. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be two channels, I think, for church for some time to come. Now, my audience in this next statement is more of the congregation that's listening than it is you. 
But what I hear you saying there is something that I've thought about a great deal. There is this device that the congregations use that uh, most congregations still use called a nominating committee report. And in it are all the offices in which you have people and responsibilities assigned so that the weight of a church is carried by a lot of people. Uh, a church that is a, a contemporary virtual sort of church that runs three or 4,000 people every Sunday has already got that person that you're talking about. They've already, they're paying somebody to sit in an office and do that every week. What, what you're talking about is congregations our size who will have a lay person who their new job is, they're not serving in the nursery. You know, that's not what they do. They don't serve on the hospitality committee. They get uh, all the passwords to all the sort of social media we have, and they go in and they explore around and they see new names and new faces and they reach out to those new names and new faces. Mm -hmm. um, this past Sunday, our welcome was done from Boston and our scripture reading was from Portland. Wow. Um, you know, the, I, I'm hesitant to use this next example. I don't think it's going to be this extreme, but I do think that it is, it's going to head in this direction for a bit. Uh, the Sierra Club, of course, is a, a group of people who work uh, to protect the land and their conservationists. Uh, being a member of the Sierra Club means that three times a year, uh, I go out on a stretch of highway and work with a group of people to clean up that stretch of highway. Uh, it means that I'm on an email list where I get an email from them at least you know, weekly. I don't always open it. I don't always do anything that it says do, but that's their way of staying in touch with me. And in those three visits to actually go out and pick up trash, there's usually a post event of a lunch where you sit around the table and you talk and you visit and you catch up and you learn who their family is. Um, and then when Christmas or Thanksgiving rolls around, you usually get an invite from one of those people in that little group that picks up trash to say, hey, uh, you know, while we've got the house decorated, we want to just invite our friends from the Sierra Club over. So come over Wednesday night for, um, you know, Christmas. Yeah. And it's our connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think church will be that extreme, but I do think there will be people who have common calls on, say, the children's ministry or common calls on the mission projects who see that group of people repeatedly through a year but they may not see others. We've got to move on. We're running out of time, Jay. You're taking up all the time. Uh, what follows, um, I'll tell you what. Uh, okay, what follows is a series of questions. They're just really easy okay. questions, um, and they're more about exploring uh, who you are than actually moving the ball theologically, okay? So, you just answer them. I will make no commentary. I will not ask you to explain yourself. Sandal uh, or shoes? Uh, shoe. Cake or pie? Pie. Really? Okay. Yes. I said I wouldn't make any comment. 100%. Rock of Ages or What a Beautiful Name? I don't know What a Beautiful Name, so Rock uh, of Ages. Rock of Ages. <laughs> Early Riser or Night Owl? 100% Early Riser. Italy or Ireland? Scotland and Greece. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one of y'all in the crowd. <laughs> All right. Do we preach the gospel or do we preach the Bible? Gospel. Now that one I will ask you to talk a little bit about. <laughs> what does it mean? What is the, when you hear those phrases, uh, don't go back to theology school and give us the lecture that you got from uh, Will Williman or whoever. Uh, but when you hear those two phrases, how are they different? Explain those. Explain that to our people. How those two phrases are different. Well, I mean, for for a long time in Baptist life, the debate has been: uh, is the Bible God's revelation? Or is the Bible the record of God's revelation, right? Mm -hmm. Different sort of ways of thinking about how it's inspired, 
um, different ways of thinking about how it operates in the community. And, and I tend to go with um, the Bible is God's divine record of the revelation of God in, in the, the people of Israel and then in Jesus, the Messiah, right? And so the gospel is what is revealed by the Bible to be the grace that operates from God, the, the love of God in us and the call and the power to love others that comes through faith. Um, the gospel is um, contextual in its expression. Um, and the Bible captures a limited context from which we can extrapolate what the, how the gospel applies to the rest of our lives, mm -hmm. right? So the Bible is authoritative. This is what God is like, right? But its authority is to shape how we live in response to what God is like rather than um, to prescribe, uh, you know, uh, preaching the Bible would be con trying to conform life to that context, right? The things that made sense, you know, there. So the, the, preaching the Bible to me would be a sort of biblical literalism um, that's just impossible to maintain. Whereas, no. good. Well, I was going to say, whereas preaching the gospel is life giving and equipping for life now, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this is not a perfect example, but when you think of, when I think of the difference between um, medi medical information and son, there's two different things there. Yeah. I, I would say that preaching the Bible is the, is the whole spectrum of med the, all of medical research. It's all of it. But when you go to your doctor, you don't want your doctor to be all, you, you don't want all of this. What you want is medicine. What you want is the good news of how do you get rid of that cough? Or, you know, how do you, your shoulder not hurt every time you go back this way? The thing is, that just, we shouldn't have been so active when we were younger. That's the problem, you know. So <laughs> tell me. Yeah. Medicine is very different than the medical history, just as the gospel is just a portion of that bigger biblical narrative. Does that make sense? I mean, yeah, for sure. What the, so people like, need, what the people really need is medicine. So what the people really need is the gospel. The gospel is yeah. good news. Yes. So, so for example, right, if, if you read toward the end of Galatians 5, there's this long list of, of thing of, of bad behavior that, that Paul says, you know, are sort of indications of a, of a failed, um, of choosing to live by the flesh, right? Yeah. And so uh, preaching the Bible might imply that if we can just avoid those, the things in that list, we'll be fine, right? But humans have devised many, many other ways to be terrible and to, and to miss living by the spirit, right? Yeah. So the gospel says, look, living by the flesh, here's some examples, don't lead to life, but living by the spirit leads to these experiences and, and many others, right? right. So, yeah, so it's that kind of thing, you're right. I understand, perfectly. Well, Jay, I, I do appreciate the time this morning. Oh, it's been fun, thank you. As I said earlier, Jay is the uh, coordinator of the CBF of South Carolina, and CBF is the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship. Maybe, you know, Ashley's going to be unavailable during the month of August. I don't know if you'll be able to come back. But um, if we did want to do another lesson on the history of Baptist, Ooh. we could uh, talk about where CBF came from, uh, sort of the, the origins of it. Um, and that would be interesting to me. You know, one of the things I want to circle back to real quickly because I'm looking at the time and we're almost done. Okay. You said you got an MTS, which is a Master's of Sacred Theology. No, I got a THM. MDiv and THM. Mm -hmm. THM is a Master's of Theology, right? Yes. Yes. A year of <laughs> academic study after the professional study. And it requires an actual document, right? I mean, you have to write a dissertation. It does. 
It's it's behind me somewhere over there. Well, just tell tell us what you wrote on. I bet you can remember. Uh, yeah, I wrote. Uh, the title was "Formation of a Moderate Identity: The Women's Missionary Union in the 1970s." And so uh -huh. I I looked at all of WMU's literature published in the 1970s and sort of process it process it through a lens in comparison to other women's activist groups of the 70s huh. to sort of to sort of see where there was overlap and where there was difference. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, yeah, and to no one's surprise, the WMU um, elevated promotion of missions and downplayed most of the other social changes for women in the 70s um, for fear of you know, losing influence to support yeah. missions. There were some hints that there were some people pushing at, you know, inclusion of some of the more, uh, uh, some of the social changes for women in the 70s, trying to, you know, be a little more progressive, but it always, you know, was limited. So. Well, we'll definitely have to get together again, because I think we could roll that into a history of Baptists there. We could. Yeah. And the WMU right. office, tell the good folks where the WMU office is. WMU is Women's Missionary <laughs> Union. Yeah was uh, the Missionary uh, Information Education Wing at the Southern Baptist Convention. And it was Women's located. Auxiliary to the Southern Baptist Convention, and it is headquartered on Missionary Ridge in Birmingham, Alabama. And when you say Birmingham, Alabama, you always have to say Roll Tide. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jay, thank you very much. Thanks for day. having me. Yeah, All thanks. Right.